I'm talking about part L1A primarily, uh, as opposed to L1B, uh, which covers refurbishment of, uh, of dwellings. Um, so very quickly, Hodkinson Consultancy, um, we are an environmental and energy consultancy based in uh, West London over in Pinner. Um, we carry out uh, a lot of uh, code for sustainable homes and bream assessments. I think we carried out more code assessments last year than any other organisation, which is a claim to fame. <laughs> um, we also uh, look after Part L compliance for large housing developers and housing associations, uh, developing their energy strategies, master plans, etc. Um, do a lot of work on district heating schemes, um, setting uh, tariffs and uh, carrying out tenders for uh, ESCOs. And um, in general, we work on some of the largest uh, regeneration schemes in, uh, in the UK. So, uh, for example, we're, we're working down in Kidbrook at the moment on the master plan, right down to individual dwelling assessments uh, for 6,000 homes between uh, a few years ago, and I guess it will be finishing in about 2025. Um, so, yeah, Part L, 1A, came in uh, to effect back in April. Um, what I'm going to run through are the transitional arrangements, just in case anyone is still unsure about those. Hopefully, though, you uh, were told by your energy assessors when you needed to register schemes if you wanted to be stuck to the uh, 2010 regs. Um, run through some of the headline uh, changes to each of the five criteria. Uh, and then I've got some case studies um, of buildings which we had assessed under the, uh, the 2010 regulations and seeing exactly how they perform under the new regulations, which gives you a, hopefully will give you an idea of the scope of the change, uh, what areas you might need to focus on and the sorts of development, developments which might already be compliant. Uh, without you really having to change your, your standard spec. Uh, so the uh, transitional arrangements, essentially uh, the document was published in uh, November last year, which didn't give people a huge amount of time before, um, before they had to switch over to the new regs. Uh, as with uh, the introduction of the 2010 regs, however, there is uh, a period um, where you can still assess uh, dwellings under, under the old regs. So if you commence work on site before the 6th of April this year, um, then you're safe, you're tied to the, uh, the current regs, or sorry, the, the regs um, as of 2010. Um, and if you registered your, your scheme with building control, uh, either with an initial notice, a building notice, or a full plan submission uh, before the 6th of April, then you're, you're also going to be tied into the 2010 regs provided you make a start on site before the 6th of April 2015. Um, so they, they will lapse if you uh, have a large delay in, um, in getting on site and starting. Um, so the headline changes. Um, first one, and really primarily the largest change, the, the thing that grabbed all the headlines was uh, uh, Criterion 1, which is achieving the uh, the TER, apologies for all the acronyms, uh, that's the target emission rate. So hopefully most of you are familiar with the fact that you, you have a target emission rate under Part L and your, your actual dwelling emission rate, i.e. the way that your, your dwelling as built performs or as designed, um, is, uh, must be equal to or lower than that. Um, so... The two things within Criterion 1 are that uh, the TER um, will now be based on a concurrent notional dwelling. Um, and that's, uh, hopefully we can go through uh, the handouts that I've given you there. It's based on a whole set of U values. Uh, and arguably it's a little bit more transparent the way that your, your TER will now be calculated. But the, re the really big thing uh, which Code for Sustainable Homes arguably paved the way for is the introduction of the target fabric energy efficiency rate. And the idea of, of this and ENE2 under the Code for Sustainable Homes is to stop people building uh, leaky, poorly insulated dwellings and meeting their emissions requirements simply by appending uh, low, low carbon technologies, renewables, etc. 
Uh, criterion two, the limits on design flexibility. So these are the maximum U values that you can have, uh, maximum air permeability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They haven't changed since the old regs, so there's no major changes to criterion two. Criterion three, limiting the effects of overheating uh, or heat gains in summer. Um, there's no major change there. There's nothing uh, additional required as such. Obviously, you're going to be insulating dwellings better in order to meet your target fabric energy efficiency rating. So it might be more challenging to demonstrate that your dwelling isn't going to be at risk of overheating in summer. Um, but essentially, the, the guidance remains the same. The one thing that was introduced and is very, very relevant to a lot of the schemes that I'm working on at the moment uh, is that it's introduced a, a comment and a recommendation that uh, the heat losses and heat gains from circulation pipe work, particularly in corridors and blocks of flats, are taken into consideration uh, in the design of uh, dwellings. There's no standard being set, there's no target for that, but it's raising the issue with building control, so it might be a question that starts to be raised, and quite rightly, because some of the layouts of pipe work going through blocks of flats are unnecessarily complex and cause unnecessary heat gains and essentially cause corridors to become roasting 40 degree uh, dark holes in the summer. So, uh, Moving on, criterion four, uh, the consistency of uh, building performance. So that's uh, making sure that your, your building as uh, built performs as designed, as, uh, yeah, as, it, as it was designed. Uh, there aren't any significant changes to this criterion either. However, again, because of the, the more onerous targets that you've got to meet, uh, if you weren't already doing this for 2010 regs, I can't really see many developments getting away without doing 100% air leakage testing at the end of the build, uh, which obviously presents quite a large project management and scheduling uh, challenge to, to any uh, large schemes. Um, if you don't test 100% of your dwellings, obviously you have a penalty uh, put on any of the dwellings that don't get tested of uh, two meters cubed per meter squared per hour. Uh, and that will be very significant in terms of the fabric energy efficiency rating that that dwelling achieves and the, uh, the overall um, dwelling emission rate. Um, Criterion five, provisions for the energy efficient operation of the dwelling. Uh, this is probably more relevant to energy assessors and uh, administrators, but um, and I think this is a really good thing. Now, when an EPC is issued at the end of the build program, uh, the data which was used to produce that EPC, the energy performance certificate, needs to be provided with that. Um, and we see, not regularly, but uh, too often, uh, EPCs coming back when residents have questioned why the floor area of their dwelling only appears to be 50% of what it actually is, and therefore that dwelling's been sold or rented uh, on a false promise of predicted fuel bills. Um, so this hopefully will introduce more transparency to residents and to housing associations and developers as to exactly how the target emission rate, the dwelling emission rate and the fee was calculated for, for that particular dwelling. Um, so as I said, the, the major changes really have come in under criterion one, the target emission rate, but also the, the target fabric energy efficiency rate. Um, so this uh, notional concurrent dwelling or concurrent notional dwelling uh, is defined in SAP. Um, and in some ways, it's going to make it easier for developers to come up with standard specifications, because if you simply follow the target U values, which have um, put on the, the handouts there that come straight from the SAP document, um, then there is no reason why you should expect uh, the dwelling to fail as long as you can meet those in practice. Uh, we'll go through some of the, the headline um, figures in that appendix in a second. Um, some of them are, are incidentally very challenging, uh, but as I said, it does give you, you clarity. For the target emission rate, you can still meet that using a top-up um, of renewables or low and zero carbon technologies. So if you've got to include, say, a CHP engine for London plan compliance, if you're building uh, within the scope of the GLA, um, then that will help you get to your target emission rate. However, um, when you start looking at the target fee, renewables will not help you at all in getting there. You've got to meet this target fabric energy efficiency rate through the fabric alone. Uh, what they have done 
is said that if you take your building and try to build to uh, the spec which is in Appendix R in your handout, but for some reason can't meet up to 15% of, uh, of the fabric energy efficiency rate that uh, emerges from uh, using those notional uh, figures, then uh, that's okay. You've got a 15% margin. So it gives you a little bit of scope. And so if you look at some of the thermal bridges that you've got to, or thermal bridging values that you've got to meet uh, within this appendix, you'll be glad to know that you've got 15% leeway to try and catch up with, uh, with some of the targets. Um, and this really, I, I tend to harp on about thermal bridging a lot, and it, it does seem to be one of the main focuses of the new, new set of regs. Uh, one quick workaround that uh, SAP, SAP assessors and developers have been using for quite some time now is if you are building in a non-traditional uh, construction form, um, or if you're, say, building a block of flats uh, with a lot of mid-floor, mid-terraced flats, um, people tended to stray away from actually bothering to calculate the, the heat loss from thermal bridges. And a convention in SAP was then that you could just apply a, a notional figure of 0.15 uh, as your, your thermal bridging value. What uh, the new version of Partel uh, does to anybody who's, uh, who's too lazy to calculate the thermal bridges or have decided that actually it won't benefit them to do that is to um, put on a, a large penalty so you, uh, you do have the option of putting in a, a notional um, default value of 0.15, but then in your uh, actual dwelling, um, the, the actual dwelling will have a far better um, value. So um, that's, that's the scope of the difference, 0 0.05 versus 0.15. And in any calculation that you do, you'll, you'll very quickly work out that um, it's not beneficial to use default uh, thermal bridging values anymore. So it makes the SAP assessor's job a little bit more onerous. They've got to go through and measure all the bridges and really think about which ones they can improve upon. But that's the whole idea, I think. It's, it's to raise the issue of thermal bridging. And thermal bridges, ultimately, these days in well-insulated buildings can account for 30% or more of the heat loss um, of, of that dwelling. So they're really um, correct, I think, in, in raising the focus on these. Um, so just running through uh, this handout that I've just given you, it's arguably one of the, the duller handouts that you might have seen, but there are some interesting points that get raised in it. Um, firstly, uh, the opening uh, areas of windows or glazing. Um, we've done some testing on this, and essentially if you have a, a very highly glazed, uh, say a penthouse apartment or something like that, uh, where the glazed area of the dwelling is more than 25% of the dwelling floor area, you'll find that it becomes very, very challenging very quickly for every percentage point that you go over the 25% cutoff. So, you know, if you've got uh, a large curtain walled area, that uh, anything over 25% of it, the U value of the glazing, which say might be 1.5, including on the thermal bridges, will be compared to a, a wall U value, an external wall U value, which is almost um, a tenth of the U value of the, uh, the external glazing. And there's no way around that. The, the only way that you can do it is to make large improvements to the fabric elsewhere in the building, reduce your air permeability, really ramp up your, your thermal bridging performance. Uh, that's the only way you can do it. So it's not necessarily discouraging very highly glazed dwellings. It's making you really think about uh, the heat loss that you get through them. And of course, that will impact on overheating as well. Um, external walls, uh, they, uh, the target uh, U-value for that is 0.18. So anybody building traditional construction with air creep block work and 150 mil cavity filled with decent uh, insulation should just about be, be meeting that, that U-value. However, if you want to improve upon that, all of a sudden, traditional uh, brick and block work um, construction start to become a lot more challenging. I think, but you might find that you're better off looking at off-site manufacture um, or a frame system, wherein U values beyond 0.18 are more easily achieved. Um, party walls. So, continuing the theme from 2010, uh, you'd be foolish not to uh, fully insulate 
um, and edge seal your cavity walls, uh, cavity party walls. Um, one issue that comes up in a lot of projects is when you're building blocks of flats and you've got solid concrete floors above and below, um, whether or not you need to insulate your sort of lightweight steel uh, C stud work walls. Um, in general, building control uh, insists on that. I'm not sure um, whether anybody else has got any experience of, of it. In general, I, I, I sort of look at the, that party wall target and thought it was really focused at terraced houses where you could have air transfer coming from a floor void and going up through the roof. Um, but if you're considering doing anything but fully filling sea stud walls and blocks of flats, um, definitely speak to your, your building control officer to see whether um, a, a U value of zero would still be applied to that. If you follow the word of the guidance, that's, that's uh, what should be done. Floor and wall U values, sorry, floor and roof U values haven't really um, changed. I imagine most people are already <coughs> achieving similar U values to that. It's nothing too radical. The only area where I would say you need to be a little bit concerned is if you're building flat roof construction or um, insulating between rafters rather, rather than at joist level. The 0.13 target there might become slightly more challenging then. Um, glazing, really getting to the bottom or the, the top of uh, what double, double glazed windows will achieve, um, 1.4. Uh, that can be an average U value across all the glazing in the dwelling, but you're certainly not going to be getting much beyond that. I know some manufacturers are claiming they can get 1.2 with double glazing, maybe even slightly lower than that, but really that's, that's the absolute cutoff before you start looking at triple glazing. Uh, the solar energy transmittance there is becoming, again, becoming more and more important when you start to consider overheating in dwellings. So a 0.63 uh, solar energy transmittance is a fairly standard soft coat, uh, low E double glazed uh, window. Um, in general, for blocks of flats in particular, we're now finding that you actually need to go for G values below that. Often not quite what we would consider to be solar control glazing, either glazing where you start to see a tint, a visible tint uh, through the glass. But even so, um, it, it's something to be aware of. Uh, so it, just because we've got this list of targets, it doesn't necessarily mean you can just follow the targets. And, know that you'll comply with all the criteria in, um, in part L. Uh, thermal mass, medium. Um, in some of the case studies, it's really interesting how thermal mass impacts the, uh, the fabric energy efficiency rating and the um, dwelling emission rate of dwellings. Um, sometimes going for low thermal mass, you'll find that it, it really uh, improves the performance in terms of CO2 and um, and the fabric performance. In others, you'll find that it doesn't, and it can actually have a negative impact. So, um, so yeah, I'll give you some examples of uh, different dwellings and the effect that it's had on those in a second. Uh, ventilation, air permeability of five. Um, that's not, not beyond what we're finding most dwellings are achieving now if they're being tested. Uh, in general, from all of our air permeability tests that we received last year, the average was slightly below five. But of course, that doesn't uh, mean that there aren't some outlying dwellings that are uh, struggling to, to get down to that level. Um, other than that, uh, the, the heating system would be based on a gas boiler uh, in general. Um, and if you're, if you're electrically heating a property, if you can get away with that anywhere, uh, anymore, then um, it would be based on a gas boiler still. However, that gas boiler would, or the, the dwelling emission rate would then have a fuel factor of 1.55 applied to it, very similar to what was happening under Part L 2010. Uh, some people call it the heat, heat pump loophole. It's primarily designed for people who don't have access to the gas grid to make an allowance for the fact that if you are using grid electricity, it becomes very, very difficult to, to meet a gas baseline. Um, so, other than that, in Criterion 1, as I said, uh, the fuel factor for electricity has gone up very, very marginally from 1.47 to 1.55. We found that decision interesting given that in the consultation there was a lot of talk about removing that fuel factor altogether. So, electrically heated dwellings would have to perform on a par in terms of CO2 
um, with, a, with a gas heated dwelling. Um, however, it's actually, it's actually gone up slightly. Um, the emissions factors, uh, they've added more carbon to, uh, to the mains gas and uh, electricity has gone up very, very marginally other than um, electricity that you're gener generating on site. You don't get quite as much of a benefit um, for that electricity, although it's only a very marginal change. Um, it's a bit of a dark art as far as I know how they calculate these figures, but the, the sort of takeaway, um, takeaway message is that gas has become slightly closer to electricity in terms of the way it performs in CO2 emissions. Um, so, yeah, working through some examples, uh, as I said, we, we took some uh, buildings that we'd already assessed for Part L 2010, and the developers had the comfort of knowing that they'd already registered uh, and designed these buildings to be Part L 2010 compliant. Uh, however, they were interested, and we were interested to see what would happen if they were suddenly put under the 2013 regs. So a seven-storey apartment block, this is somewhere in North London. So it's London plan, uh, subject to the London plan, 25% uh, target, um, not the new 35% one. Um, in this building, we've got the reference, or in this table, sorry, we've got the re reference values there. So the ones from the, uh, the, the handout that I've just given you, Appendix R of SAP and the actual uh, values that we've calculated uh, for, for the building. If they're highlighted in red, it means it's actually had a negative impact on the fee and the TER and the DER of that building. If they're highlighted in green, it means that um, what they've put in is an improvement over the over the notional building. And orange is kind of more or less um, more or less the same. Uh, so yeah, in, in this instance, moving shifting to a low um, low thermal mass building, and this is uh, a concrete frame, admittedly, but it's um, built out with a Metsec steel infill, so there's a lot of just plasterboard and insulation in this building, and the, the overall balance of it is that it's uh, a lightweight building. They've insulated over the, the floor, concrete floor slab as well, which removes the benefit of any thermal, uh, thermal mass stored in the concrete floors. Um, it was only very minor, minorly negative, uh, the change in, in that case, though. The floors and the roof, uh, they're not maxing those out. It's a relatively um, uh, high-rise block, and therefore the floor and the U-values don't have a, a large impact on the overall building CO2 performance. Um, but again, you know, they're only marginally worse. Uh, the external walls, as I was saying, you know, that 0.18 U-value is very easy to achieve with something like a, a Metsec steel infill construction uh, over a concrete frame. If they were building um, using traditional construction, uh, possibly up to seven storeys, I'm not sure what sort of block work they'd have to do in order to do that. Um, they almost certainly wouldn't be able to achieve that U value because of the dense block work being employed. Um, glazing, they've achieved the, the notional value there. Um, doors onto corridors, uh, the corridors are being heated, so they, they're not included in the, the overall part L calculations. Um, the ventilation system, Contrary to popular belief, even though they've got a, a very efficient centralised mechanical etch trap ventilation system in there, that didn't really provide much of a benefit over an uh, intermittent etch trap fan system. So, you know, all these um, CMEV systems, they're not necessarily much better than a traditional ventilation system. Of course, that's been driven by other considerations under Part F, not, um, not Part L. Air permeability. We've yet to carry out the tests, but hopefully they'll be scoring five or below. Um, and the space and water heating system, uh, they've had to in, in, uh, include a gas CHP uh, system in order to achieve their um, London plan compliance and the 25% improvement over Partel uh, that, that that entails. Um, the really big thing that happened and came out of this exercise is that we noticed the, the drawbacks of using a default thermal bridging um, uh, value in this calculation. Because it's a concrete frame building, there are no off-the-shelf thermal bridges or thermal bridging values that you can use for that sort of construction. Um, I imagine under the new regs, uh, builders and developers and the people who supply these frames and framing systems are going to be very quickly catching up 
and developing uh, systems si similar to the constructive details, uh, the accredited details and, and other sort of off-the-shelf thermal bridging values that you can get. Um, so a three-storey apartment block, or block of flats. Um, this was built out in traditional masonry um, and failed to meet some of, the, uh, some of the notional values. So you can see um, the, uh, the thermal mass was the same. Floor and external wall U values in the roof are nowhere near, um, nowhere near the, the notional values included. Uh, the uh, external wall U value was built to 150 mil cavity, but because of the density of the block work, there, there was no way that they could get down any lower than that without going to um, fairly expensive insulation uh, types. I think they went for a fully filled um, cavity in this case. Um, CMEV, again, not much difference. Uh, on the space and water heating, they did have a really good gas uh, combi boiler in each flat. Uh, however, there was no weather compensation um, included within that uh, gas boiler system. And one thing that has come out in the new version of SAP is that um, you, you must demonstrate, if you are going to say that there is weather compensation on your boiler, that a weather compensator, which is compatible with the boiler you've specified, actually exists. And quite often we'll, we'll see sort of schedules going around saying weather compensation included. And if you actually look up the backseat or the uh, ideal boiler that, that's been specified with that, it, it turns out that there is no, no compatible system. The other thing, talking to m and &E engineers recently that uh, we've come across is that on single aspect flats, it can be quite challenging to include weather compensation in a boiler system. If you've got a, a weather compensator and it's in direct sunlight all day, that's going to really skew the way that that, that uh, compensation system works. So you, you need to have somewhere shaded, uh, ideally, uh, where you can locate the, uh, the weather compensation system. So again, that, that resulted in a minor uh, negative change over the baseline. Uh, thermal bridging, um, they had used accredited construction details. Um, notably, most of the, the thermal bridging values in Appendix R, the, the notional building, are very similar to the accredited detail, um, accredited detail uh, standards. However, if you look at lintels, which account for a huge amount of uh, thermal bridging in dwellings, uh, the notional building has gone way beyond the standard expected under an accredited detail um, system. So all these checklists that you might be asked to sign at the end of um, new build development programs for your SAP assessors, most of those will, will still comply with this notional building, but watch out for lintels. They were, I believe, 600% uh, less heat loss in the, in the notional building compared to our standard CLG published accredited details. Renewables, they'd put on 0.4 kilowatt peak of PV, um, solar PV, electricity generation per flat, um, again, in order to meet, meet a planning target in this case. I think they already met uh, Part L 2010. And going right down to a, a standard semi-detached house using 100, and, uh, 100 mil cavity traditional construction, um, you can see primarily it's the external walls that really underperform in this case. They'd gone for 1.5 U-value double glazing, which is marginally worse. External doors were 1.6, which is really not very good. Um, there's no reason why an external door these days shouldn't be achieving the notional value in uh, Appendix R, which is 1, um, if it's well insulated and well sealed. Um, again, this building had no weather compensation included, so although the gas boiler was very efficient, it didn't quite meet the standard. Um, and uh, ACDs were used, again, the lintel, value, the lintel Y value didn't quite get to, uh, get to the standard. Renewables here, again, for a planning, um, planning requirement, not for Part L compliance. Uh, so that, that really boosted up the, uh, the dwelling emission rate performance. So in order to give you an idea of how each of these performs um, when, they, they, when they were assessed, uh, to interpret this graph, basically that's their assessment under 2010. You can all see that the green margin there is um, the margin between the target emission rate and the dwelling emission rate. So they've all overperformed significantly. And the reason they performed better in terms of emissions was that they had planning targets over and above the Partel um, minimum standard. 
uh, and I think most of them were, were up around a 25% improvement. If we then take the same dwellings, these are exactly the same calculations, just imported into the new SAP software, with a few things tweaked because the assessment process has been updated. Uh, you can see that they all still pass, so they've, they've already met um, their Part L 2013 requirements, just building in exactly the same way they were planning to a couple of years ago. The margin has obviously reduced significantly for some of them, but in other cases, the margin really didn't change very much at all. I've got the figures for that in a second. Um, so in terms of dwelling emission rate, they're, they're home and dry planning and cope for sustainable homes targets and things like that have already prepared these developments um, to comply with the new version of the regs. However, when you look at the fee performance against the uh, target fee, uh, most notably, um, the seven-storey block of flats has failed, so it wouldn't pass 2013 regs. And the reason that we pinned on, on that failure is that they've used default thermal bridging because they're not using traditional construction methods. There are no off-the-shelf psi values available for that form of construction. They've ticked the, the default thermal bridging box and therefore they've had that penalty applied to them and failed to meet uh, their fabric targets. The other two, uh, the three-storey block of flats and the semi-detached house, um, just about met the, um, the, the target fee. You might ask why, if you go back to, say, the semi-detached house, you can see quite a lot of the fabric values are worse than the notional building, but that is because there's that 15% uh, leeway that they've allowed. So you don't have to build exactly to this spec. You've got 15% uh, leeway in your fee, uh, dwelling fee rating. So it's a slow introduction, um, introduction to the uh, idea of um, meeting a, a target fee. And most of you, if you're building to Code 3 or Code 4, will already probably be considering this maybe to a, a greater extent than uh, Partel is going to be driving you towards unless you've uh, been building non-traditional construction forms where you've been using default thermal bridging. Um, and this just a numerical form, really. If you compare what the first line with the second line, you see the, the difference in improvements over Partel. So although uh, notionally when it, when it was published, they were talking about an aggregate 6% reduction in CO2 emissions across all building stock being assessed um, for Partel 2013 compliance, you can see that for the three-storey three block of flats, actually uh, there was only a 1% reduction um, in terms of improvements over the target emission rate between Part L 2010 and Part L 2013. So changing the, the version of the regs only made 1% difference. Uh, for the seven-storey block of flats, there's a huge difference. The improvement went from 27% uh, over Part L 2010 to only achieving 13% over Part L 2013. And that, again, we put down to the uh, default thermal bridging. So not calculating thermal bridging, Results, results in that massive uh, reduction in performance. Um, it's probably worth mentioning here that, of course, this is only an assessment procedure. The thermal bridging in that block might very well be far better um, than the default and the way that that's been reflected in the assessment. However, if it's not assessed, then you can't assume it's going to be any worse than a default. Uh, and then the semi-detached house is more in line with what, um, what was said at the release of Partel. So you've got 2010, it had a 28 improvement over the baseline, uh, and then it's reduced by 8% under the new regs, so it's close to that 6% that was banded around. Um, so further considerations um, going forward. Obviously, the London plan target now requires a 35% improvement over Partel, uh, over the new version of Partel. I think until the beginning of July, if you're still submitting planning assessments uh, or planning applications with energy statements, you can assess it <coughs> under the 2010 regs and say that you're going to achieve a 40% improvement over that standard, um, which is clearly a lot more challenging than meeting these, uh, these baseline 2013 targets. The overheating of dwellings is, I, I think it's probably the, the problem that I spend long uh, longer than anything else dealing with uh, in our practice at the moment. 
uh, blocks of flats, even lightweight houses, um, you just simply can't, can't demonstrate uh, compliance with, uh, with Partel, either 2010 or 2013, without really thinking about how you're going to ventilate these dwellings properly, what sort of uh, solar control um, glazing you're putting in. Ideally, if it's been designed in a planning stage and if we've been consulted early enough, you know, external shading factors which minimise uh, aggressive uh, summertime solar gains but maximise good winter solar gains which reduce the space heating loads. Um, that kind of uh, issue, it, it causes a lot of headaches and there's no really easy way to approach it. Um, we increasingly find that SAP isn't... Um, isn't really a, a adequate way of assessing the overheating um, risk of dwellings or, or buildings in general. So we do a lot of uh, modeling using dynamic simulation software in which you can really reflect how the building's going to be used, um, the sort of occupancy rates and occupancy times of that dwelling, uh, the exact window opening areas and the ventilation rates that you can get through your mechanical ventilation system if that's needed. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a Pandora's box that's slowly been opening, but with the increased fa fabric standards um, that have now been introduced, it's really fully open and uh, it should be as big a consideration at early design stage as meeting your, your dwelling emission rate and your fabric, emission, fabric energy performance rate. Um, more compliant construction details are needed. Um, as I was saying, it's all, all down to fabric uh, or thermal bridging values, uh, compliance with the fee. Um, everything else, I think the, the industry is more or less geared up to meet or come close to meeting the, uh, the fabric values. However, these thermal bridges um, can cause headaches. Um, then you've got, uh, notably, uh, under the 26th or the proposals for 2016, um, they're proposing to introduce absolute targets for your target emission rates and your dwelling uh, and your target fabric energy efficiency rate. What I mean by absolute um, figures or absolute targets is that you'll have to meet 46 kilowatt hours per square meter per year um, fabric energy efficiency performance, no matter what the shape of your dwelling. So if you're building a, say, a floor over a garage flat, um, which has a heat loss floor, a heat loss roof, and four heat loss walls. Um, if it's assessed in 2013, it allows for the fact that you've got a very inefficient built form there. So it, it adjusts the target and uh, almost compensates for it. If you're building under 2016, and it is indeed an, a, an absolute target that you're trying to hit, um, then you'll be penalized for building um, inefficient built forms with a lot of heat loss area. It's really, and I think it's probably going in the right direction in order to minimize heating bills. Um, it's discouraging uh, the, the use of non-compact design uh, wherever possible. Or saying that if you do insist on building non-compact design with a lot of heat loss area, then you should compensate for it through even higher standards of energy efficiency in the fabric. Um, and then com coming back again really to overheating, but also uh, the health and well-being of residents. You can see that obviously you're being encouraged to build far more airtight dwellings under the new regs. Um, and that is going to raise questions about the, um, the adequacy of the current ventilation systems and the way that residents operate those uh, ventilation systems. So um, I'm sure we've all heard stories of people turning off their mechanical ventilation and heat recovery systems because they think the fans actually cost more money than they save. Uh, obviously that will have huge impacts on the the internal air quality of those dwellings. Um, and I, I think the, our takeaway message is always that Part F, uh, the ventilation standard of the build, building regs, really just sets minimum targets and people should be engaging with their en engineers and uh, design teams to make sure that you're not just hitting minimum standards, you're really hitting best practice standards and thinking about uh, exactly how a dwelling is going to be, to be ventilated. That, links very closely to another set of issues that we're coming across more and more frequently, which is air quality and noise uh, impact assessments, both saying that windows shouldn't be open at all during any conditions. So when it's very, very hot outside, if you're building next to a, a busy railway line or a motorway, is it really fair to assume that a, a resident is going to open their windows wide in order to cool their dwelling during the summer? 
Uh, and if they're not going to be able to do that, how on earth do you ventilate it properly in order to cool the dwelling without putting in expensive air conditioning systems?